This is one of the most popular cities in sub-Saharan Africa. More than four million people live here. Among them, eight-year-old Ida, a coding wizard. Emmabet Tesfai, the manager of a big flower farm. And Asifa Mengesha, a pioneer in Ethiopia's solar power industry. All three illustrate how Africa's fortunes might change in the coming decades. The continent faces many challenges, including the recent spread of COVID-19. But in the long term, there is reason to be optimistic. By the end of this century, Africa is set to play a much bigger role in world affairs. The Asian growth miracle is likely to slow. Africa's rapid rise could be next. Some eight million natives, whom the whites still look upon, in the words of Rudyard Kipling, as the new caught sullen peoples, half devil and half child. For hundreds of years, Africa was dismissed by much of the rest of the world. Today, Africa is too big to ignore. Its population is growing faster than any other continent. The UN predicts that by 2100, one human being in three will be African. Doomsayers worry about overpopulation. They fear that the number of mouths will grow faster than the food supply and people will starve. But the UN's population predictions may be wrong. If Africa continues to grow at the expected rate, its population will almost double by 2050 to two and a half billion people. But in the second half of the century, forecasts diverge depending on different rates of fertility. The medium rate, which the UN expects, implies the population would almost double again by 2100. That forecast is based on the belief that the number of children each woman has will decline only slowly. But that underestimates the impact of education on girls like Ida. My name is Ida. I'm eight, eight and a half years old. My birthday is coming. I live in Ethiopia. At school, Ida is an A-star student. She loves learning. And so do many other girls in Ethiopia. Primary school enrollment rates for girls increased from around 34% in 2000 to 81% in 2015. Yeah, I do. Education has a strong influence on fertility rates. A woman with no formal education will have six or more children. This falls to four if she finished primary school and to about two if she finished secondary school. I want to go like this. First, I'm in KG prep and then I go to grade one after 12 and then I go to uh, high school and then I go to college and then I go to university. According to one study, if the rate of social development, in particular the education of girls, doesn't change, the population of Africa will be as high as the UN predicts. But look what happens to the population size if there's even a median improvement in development. And if there is a rapid rise, towards the end of the century, the population would decline, which means the more girls are educated, the lower Africa's population is likely to be. I'm telling you that girls could do anything they want, everyone in Ethiopia knows that girls could do whatever boys could do. Which way is our car? There. Both Ida's grandmother and mother were well educated and have had successful careers. Educated women are more likely to enter the workforce. Despite being half of Africa's population, women generated just 33% of the continent's collective GDP in 2018. If women enter the workforce at the same rate as men, Africa could add 10% to its GDP over the next five years. Every game, she holds our shoulders and ticks her glass. And it's not just what girls like Ida learn in school that will affect Africa's economic future, but what they learn outside school. Ida is learning to code. How many sides? Six. 
Okay, so that's... Uh... My brother wanted to code at first. He told our mom, can we go to coding school? And then she said, okay, I'll sign it up. When we grow up, we could be wonderful coders. We can teach more people to code. Gunna, uh, semi vitalim the same bala. Yeah, I cook anyone can code. Nantam to Marbet, project manager. Ida's coding school was set up by Bethlehem Desi, who, like Ida, started coding at a very young age. On my ninth birthday, I asked my father for some money and he wouldn't give it to me. We made a deal that if I made any money on the computer that we had, I'd be able to use it to celebrate my birthday. I would pitch my services, which were basically editing their videos, installing some apps on their phones. I made about $90 that day. So I figured, okay, this is what I need to do. So that's when I first started coding. Bethlehem is just 20 years old, but already has a clear vision for the future of Ethiopia's tech scene. Artificial intelligence, blockchain, and a lot of other things are happening around the world. This also will happen to us eventually. So we need to be ready more than ever. This generation needs to learn how to be smarter than the machines they're using, but also have the skills to really be in the job market in the next five to 10 years. Not everyone can code, however. To prosper, Africa needs to create all kinds of jobs. At the Eastern Industry Zone, outside Addis Ababa, thousands of Ethiopians are arriving for their shifts. The manufacturing park was built by a Chinese firm to house factories making textiles and shoes. Ethiopia's manufacturing industry is a success story. The value of its textiles and clothes exports tripled over the past 10 years. And whereas manufacturing's share of GDP is shrinking in much of the rich world, in sub-Saharan Africa, it's been growing since 2011. Yet for all the positives, the path to prosperity has potholes. Productivity is lower, and exports are growing more slowly than expected. Employee turnover is high. What's more, COVID-19 has meant that orders have slumped in the past few weeks. Ethiopia is unusual in Africa for its focus on rapid industrialization. Across the rest of the continent, there's been an expansion into what are known as industries without smokestacks, sectors such as tourism, IT, and flower farming. It's picking time at Ethiopia's Highland Flora Rose Farm under the watchful eye of farm manager Emabet Tesfai. Every day, 80,000 stems are harvested from the farm's 31 vast greenhouses to be exported all over the world. The flower industry is new for Ethiopia. It's really a challenging business because we compete with other countries to grow the quality, we have to keep the, the international standard. This is exported commodity. It helps us for the country for foreign exchange. Ethiopia's horticultural industry employs 180,000 people. It's Africa's second largest flower exporter after Kenya. Emma Betts Farm employs almost 500 local workers. Most are unskilled laborers who are trained on the job. I think it's good for the community. Uh, because if, if the industry is uh, nearby to them, I think they, they get access to come and to work. Otherwise, it will be really very difficult uh, for the workers just to live and survive. To help create jobs for their growing populations, African governments are faced with a decision. Lilas, spider mite, big some think the quickest path out of poverty is to copy China, to industrialize rapidly, giving workers jobs in factories. Others reason that since China already dominates manufacturing, their best bet is to do something else. Some see opportunities in services, such as IT, and industries without smokestacks, such as horticulture. Regardless of the route Africans take, they need to invest in technology. Mm -hmm. 
Emma Betts' farm is run by a computerized system, controlling temperature, sunlight, and irrigation. How many waters you give per day? In total, per hectare is around 40 meter cube of water. This is smart agriculture. Ideas like this need to spread. More than half of Africans make their living from farming. It's highly unproductive. Although most Africans farm, they generate just 15% of Africa's GDP. That's because the way many people farm has not changed much for hundreds of years. Modernizing farming could increase yields to help feed rising populations. It would free lots of farm workers to go and find better paid jobs in the cities. But one of the biggest obstacles to successful agriculture, or indeed other industries, is Africa's poor infrastructure, including its power supply. In a compound outside Addis Ababa, Bashadu is showing off her public shower. Ethiopia, like many African countries, is beset by chronic electricity shortages. But Bashadu has found a way to keep her business running by using power from the sun. It's too hot, you know? <laughs> the solar power water heater was a gift from Asafa Mengesha, the boss of one of Ethiopia's first companies to manufacture them. People started coming to take shower. They start coming from three towns around this area because there is no public shower in all of them. People come and pay, especially from Thursday up to Sunday, she's busy. She made a lot of money. She makes money from the sun. Asifa's business also shows one way that Africa can help curb a global threat, climate change. Africa emits just 2% of global greenhouse gases, but some experts predict it will be the continent that suffers the most from climate change. Ethiopia is a growing economy. When it starts developing and establishes many industries, then she needs industry energy. Ethiopia has ample sunshine, so why don't we take advantage of this? The Ethiopian government is spending billions of dollars building a giant dam on the Blue Nile River to generate hydropower. But Asifa is struggling to get investment into his business and is frustrated by bureaucracy. Ethiopia is worried about climate change, especially in the last four or five years. Government organizations talk a lot. In terms of practice, I don't know how far it went. Ultimately, the key to addressing Africa's problems is better governance. Many countries have terrible infrastructure, rampant corruption, obstructive officials, and occasional armed revolts. But Africans have more political choices than before. In the 1980s, most African countries were autocracies. 30 years later, most have become substantially more democratic. In 2018, Abiy Ahmed became Prime Minister of Ethiopia. He promised democracy and peace. <laughs> His work won him the Nobel Peace Prize. Yet, while all this points to a more open Ethiopia, the country could still be torn apart by ethnic uprisings. You can read more about this by clicking on the eye. Ethiopia is one of many countries in Africa that are making encouraging progress. In the short term, the continent may be severely damaged by COVID-19, but in the long term, there are good reasons to be optimistic. More girls are going to school, economies are growing, and countries are adapting to climate change. But to match China's economic success, Africa can't just copy China. It needs more competent and accountable governments. 
that provide basic services, uphold the rule of law, and educate their growing populations. If it does, the next century could yet be Africa's century. You can read more of The Economist reporting on Africa by clicking on the link opposite. That will take you to the special report on Africa's future, as well as our ongoing coverage on Africa and COVID-19. Don't forget to like and subscribe to our channel. And thanks so much for watching.